So there's a lot of things you can do to alter resting metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate. I can't cover them all, but I pulled out eight very specific ones that I thought you would be most interested in. They have the most research behind them. That's the easiest to integrate, and they are the least kooky is how I'll say it. The other final caveat here is remember, just because we acutely change your resting metabolic rate, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to lose body fat in the long term. We'll circle back to that later. But the first of our eight is what are called spicy foods. If people, this is in the lore. Uh, people talk about it a lot. It's out there a bunch. Is it really real? Yes, technically it's true. Although if you wanted to consider this to be a myth, I wouldn't push back that hard. This is how the field honestly works in a lot of the cases. It's officially there, but is it practically relevant? I'll just share with you the data and I'll let you decide. Now, I'll tell you my personal bias. I love spicy foods. I put hot sauce or some sort of spice on basically everything I eat. I love it. Uh, I actually did, I grew up not eating anything spicy, probably even into my mid-20s. Black pepper was too spicy for me. I, my family just growing up never did anything like that. But I learned to love spicy food when I started dieting. I started cutting weight and losing weight for competitions and combat sports and weightlifting and things like that. Prior to that, I'd never done it. And I'm bringing this up now because I realized, man, spicy food really helped me in that caloric management. Number one, when things are really spicy, I, at least personally, tend to not eat as much. So I'm not going to gorge as much because I'm dealing with sort of a little bit of the pain and suffering. I'm more likely to stop a little bit early. I don't know if that's really well documented scientifically, but it's certainly personally true for me. Additionally, spices, herbs, flavors can help you make food not taste as bland when you're really controlling stuff. So oftentimes when you're managing calories, you're probably not putting on a flavor factor. You're, you're managing fat. So you don't have the cheeses and the sauces. And so because of that, food can start to taste a little bit bland. The beauty of spices and hot sauces is they can be a caloric. And so you can make food taste different and you can change it up and have more variety when your total actual food intake is not that different day by day. So from a practical perspective, the work we've done with people that are trying to lose weight and me personally, I love spicy foods. I use them a ton here. Just think about exchanging out hot sauce or Tabasco for ketchup, right? Easy win there. Ketchup has a reasonable amount of calories. You can get tons of different hot sauces that don't have any. And there you go. You've saved that 50 calories or 100 calories per serving which adds up a ton. So from a practical perspective, I like it. If you don't, that's cool too. Does it do anything scientifically? Yes, it actually does. If you eat spicy foods, and most of the research here has been done on things like chili peppers, ginger, red peppers, and even turmeric, these will increase your resting metabolic rate. They'll increase your thermal effect of food, and they'll actually oftentimes lower energy intake, like I mentioned earlier. We've seen that routinely. There's actually been research on other spicy foods that wasn't as promising. Uh, I know that things people have looked at mustard, horseradish, black peppers. Those don't seem to do anything. But the other ones I mentioned a second ago do seem to do that. And they're, they're effectively working by giving you a shot of adrenaline. So more specifically, they're increasing and activating beta, beta adrenergic responses. That's the long way of saying uh, adrenaline or epinephrine. And getting a sympathetic drive. You'll see this like pretty routine and you don't have to stretch your imagination too far to think, yeah, you eat something super spicy and you get a little shot of adrenaline. All right. Now at the same time, uh, this, this is a classic Lane Norton, right? He, Dr. Norton, a friend of mine always talks about people majoring in the minors. And this is a good example of that. So technically does it increase metabolic rate? Yes. Does it do it to a level that you really care? Mm, not really sure. What you're functionally talking about here is probably three to five calories. So officially it does. Does it matter? I don't know. Um, you have you would have to eat a enormous amount of red bell peppers. You would have to probably eat ounces or pounds of ginger or turmeric for this to have a real practical output on you. So additionally, 
you get sensitized or desensitized to these things. So you may not have the same response over time. I certainly know if you would have given me Tabasco 20 years ago, I would have had a much bigger adrenaline response than I do now. And so we, since we know that's the mechanism, is it then still leading to additional increases in my resting metabolic rate? I actually don't think it does. I would assume me personally, probably nothing because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so used to it by now. So when you balance the like technically, officially, I could pull up a, a systematic review or a paper and show that it increases metabolic rate. If someone doesn't like it or it's not a preference or they're traveling, like should you really be going out of your way to strongly encourage spicy foods for people to boost metabolism? I don't think so, right? Probably not the biggest win. So while I technically have this on our list, Again, if you said this is on your list of things that don't work, I wouldn't push back that much either. Moving on then. The second on our list is actually, surprising enough, water intake. There is more than a small amount of research on water increasing metabolic activity. If you think about this for a couple of seconds, it makes perfect sense. I actually know one paper specifically looked at, I think, like 16 or 17 ounces of water and found that it increased resting metabolic rate by 10 to 30% for about an hour. Now, practically, I wouldn't recommend chugging water all day, optimally hydrate, but think about what it does. If you're ingesting something at a temperature that is lower than the temperature inside your stomach, by putting that in there, you'll have to burn calories to heat that water up. In fact, that is actually, by the way, the strict definition of a calorie. It's the exact amount of energy it takes to raise, I think it's one gram of water, one degree, uh, something like that. It's pretty close. Like the definition of a calorie is how much energy it takes to increase the temperature of water. So by definition, if your body is working to increase the temperature of your water, then it is going to be burning some calories. Now, there's also some, and I wouldn't call this extensive, but some research on then by extension of logic, colder water might be of more benefit than room temperature water. It's, should theoretically take more energy to heat up, okay? But probably the bigger benefit here, if there is one at all, is satiety. So I, I know of, uh, again, another study off the top of my head here that in, in overweight individuals, and they gave them, um, I think something like a half a liter of water, which is a reasonable amount to drink, 30 minutes before a meal. And those that group eventually lost more weight. And so what you're probably looking at here is a lot of people will, I've heard in the vernacular say things like, oh, a lot of times when you think you're hungry, you're just thirsty. I don't know if that's necessarily true or not, but having dealt with a lot of folks who have to lose weight over time, again, athletes and regular people, I will say in my personal coaching experience, making sure you're drinking water will help you reduce calorie intake, the amount of food you eat in a meal and so forth with really no consequences to digestibility unless you're you know, going extreme with it. So water is another potential option you can turn to. The effect will be minimal, but you start stacking some things on top of each other and you need to drink water anyway. So not something I would say to overdo, but just making sure you're not underhydrated is probably the biggest win here. A similar concept here, but probably more effective is using a different form of temperature regulation. That is the temperature in the environment you're in. So there have been several studies that have looked at lowering the thermostat in your house by even a few degrees, and that can lead to substantial and significant loss of body fat over time. Same exact concept here. If your body has to work a little bit harder to keep itself at a certain temperature, that is caloric expenditure. You've boosted your metabolism, and it will result in a practical and meaningful loss of body fat. Now, I wouldn't necessarily advocate dropping the thermostat so much that you're freezing and your fingers are frozen and you can't type and work, but maybe a notch or two. I have friends that have done this a lot over the years where they bring it down one degree for three months, bring it down another degree, bring it down another degree and just slowly work themselves down three or four degrees where they used to keep their house at 72 degrees and now they keep it at 66 or something reasonable like that. If this feels like majoring in the minors to you, fine. Again, my position here was just to share with you all the data that we know of, let you know how much it works, how well it works, and then you can decide what to deploy, what to disregard or not based on your situation and circumstances, all right? So playing with 
temperature, whether it is colder water or colder environment, is another option and probably more effective than the spicy food thing. But still, we haven't, I probably haven't sold you a ton on things that are really going to move the needle, but we're going to change that here soon. Fourth on our list is something I've talked about now, and that is caffeine. There is a lot of data on this. I will summarize the entire field, but you can generally expect something between like a three to 11% increase in resting metabolic rate. That's going to last somewhere between an hour to three hours. This is very, very well documented. Pretty easy. It's a stimulant. It's going to rev up energy. And it's going to tell your body to expect energy output. So it's going to get you going. Nicotine is next on my list, and it has a very similar effect. It, the magnitude of effect is a little bit smaller, generally more like 5 to 6% increase in resting metabolic rate. And it's going to last for the same, you know, 60 minutes, 120 minutes, something like that. Now, I personally don't use nicotine. We've used it in some clients. They've asked for it and we've done it with some success there. I personally like to avoid it as much as I can, but those data are there and, and use it how you will. Similar, and now we're up to number six on the list, is green tea or green tea extract. You'll see this abbreviated a lot as GTE. It has similar effect of caffeine, but in the four to 5% range for about the same length and duration. As we've mentioned for some of the stuff prior with water and spicy foods, one thing that has been documented pretty consistently with caffeine, nicotine, and green tea is they all also affect satiety. And so they're appetite suppressants. So is the benefit really in the elevation and resting metabolic rate? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. But if it helps you just not feel as hungry and not then overeat, that's probably the real win. But options, nonetheless, a lot of people are already consuming these things. I don't think you need to go in there and add additional stimulus to your life if you're already on them. You don't have to use these at all, but one more time, they are options to use or not at your discretion. Number seven on our list is a combo. I had to do it this way. If not, the list would have been 50 things or more. And I'm generally going to call these thermoregulators. So this is a handful of herbs and drugs and other stimulant-like factors that are gonna have a similar impact as caffeine and green tea and so on and so forth, but they're not in those forms. Just to give you a couple of examples, the wonderful scientist, Bill Campbell, friend of mine in Florida, has done some work in the past on guarana. Uh, you can Google that one up there, G-U-A-R-A-N-A, -A -A, um, combined with other elements. Much of the research in this field, and the reason I'm calling them you know, thermoregulators is because they're rarely single ingredient things. So they're multiple herbs combined with multiple different things and combinations and cocktails. And so you don't know what the individual effect is. But nonetheless, in these multi-ingredient thermoregulators, in, in Bill's study in particular, I, I think they gave their, I think he did it in young, healthy men, probably the college kids that are running around his lab. And they saw about a 10% increase in resting metabolic rate uh, for about three hours post-exercise. Now, what I liked about Bill's study in particular, of course, because he's such an awesome scientist, is they had a placebo group and they reported the placebo group. What I mean by that is the placebo group had a 3% increase in resting metabolic rate. So if you actually kind of cancel that out, you could still see about a 7% bump in RMR here, which I think their data was something like, it took them from about a group average of 800 or 1,850 calories to 2,000. So 150 kcal bump from this guarana-based multi-ingredient supplements. Tons of other studies have been done like this. Uh, one in particular, I know actually several of them have used things like caffeine plus GTE plus herbals and stuff like that. And if you go back to the numbers I just gave you on green tea and caffeine, combine them with other ingredients, you'll see about a 10% total increase. Again, going to last two to three hours. Others have been done on caffeine, GTE, and niacin, combined with actually uh, something called Garcinia cambogia, which was the original primary ingredient in hydroxycut. You've probably seen hydroxycuts in commercials all over the place. I think there was actually a bunch of problems with people with getting liver failure, so they took this ingredient out of it. Uh, so it's no longer in there, to my understanding, but it was in the original formulation. But nonetheless... You throw all those things together and you might see a 
or greater increase in RMR. Last one here, similar caffeine plus GTE plus yohimbine. Another one showed about a 15% bump. So you can basically see here, kind of no matter what combination you have of these stimulants and herbs, about the higher end of the impact is a 15 or so percent increase for about two to three hours, right? Whether that fits in what you like and, and how you live your life, that's up to you. I personally don't use any of these for fat loss clients. It's not how we approach it. But if you want to, there's the data. Make your choice. Next up, fish oil. Now, this is a really interesting one. We know of the many benefits of fish oil, but many don't realize the metabolic ones. Easy study here to highlight what's going on. 24 females, and they did this in, I think they were over 60, 65, six years old, uh, if I'm remembering exactly the age range there. And they gave them three grams per day of EPA and DHA for a total of 12 weeks. Now, what's cool about the study is they actually matched it with olive oil. And so calories were equated for. One group getting out the olive oil, which is obviously a very healthy food choice. And the other one specifically got fish oil. And so really into smart study design here because they, of course, matched calories, they matched fat, and they gave them not really crummy food items or low quality stuff, but two high quality items. And so what that allowed them to do is tease out the direct effects of the EPA and DHA. Net result here, and remember, this is chronic. So what happened not in the, the 60 minutes or 90 minutes or three hours post taking the fish oil, what happened at rest 12 weeks later? About a 15% increase in, uh, 14 actually I think, increase in resting metabolic rate. They saw an increase in energy expenditure during exercise by about 10%. And the fat oxidation rate, both at rest and exercise were increased about 19 and 27% respectively. What's probably more impressive than all that though, is they saw a increase in lean mass by about 4%. Take a second to digest that. By simply taking three grams per day of fish oil, not a high dose at all, you saw a chronic elevation in resting metabolic rate that had a functional and practical outcome of a 4% in lean mass compared to olive oil. Now, what do you think this would be compared to of a lower quality fat or a worse food choice in general? It would probably be substantially more. So to me, this is incredibly impressive and it is another reason why taking fish oil is probably a really smart strategy. But in full honesty here and candidly, I didn't know this. I hadn't missed this one. I was pretty aware of basically everything that we talked about so far at this point, but I had absolutely no idea that fish oil would chronically do this at rest over time. So pretty powerful, uh, pretty low hanging fruit and a pretty easy win in my opinion. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode by clicking here. <laughs>